This is Curative Design, and I'm Arun Matthews. I was researching information for another essay when I needed to quickly fact check something related to immunization. As I ran the internet search, I typed in one of my favorite names into the search field, D.A. Henderson. Instead of the usual platitudes and articles related to smallpox, new headlines came up, stating that he had passed away. While not overcome with grief, I was saddened in the way that one is when recounting the passing of a not-too-familiar family member or a friend that you had lost touch with. In truth, I had met him only once, and that too as a member of the audience, to a lecture that he gave at Johns Hopkins regarding the experience of helping to eradicate smallpox from the planet. Yes, I said eradicate smallpox from the planet. Sometimes words don't effectively capture the enormity of ideas. That simple phrase, eradicate smallpox from the planet, has spurred countless articles and books and cements the notion that with persistence, the application of innovation and technology, as well as coordinated efforts, the very fabric of biology can be altered. D.A. Henderson was responsible for all of this, and he had just died. So in homage to this fallen giant of a man, I wanted to share with you two separate insights surrounding his work. The first related to an innovation in vaccine technology, and the second relates to an innovation in process. In the story of the eradication of smallpox, both were equally important and amounted to what I like to refer to as the most significant quality improvement project the world has ever seen. But before we can talk about innovation, let's talk about what the world was like when we cohabited with a species of virus called variola. Smallpox. It is one of the deadliest diseases ever to strike humankind. It kills without prejudice, attacking the mightiest king to the lowliest peasant. Variola major, or the severe form of the smallpox infection, was a brutal disease. Having emerged in human populations thousands of years ago, it, along with another virus, influenza, is one of the few infectious diseases that decimated populations in such an effective manner that it may have actually shaped mankind's history. Historians posit that influenza and smallpox may have weakened Aboriginal populations in Australia, the US, and South America to the point that colonization of them became feasible. Apparently, George Washington debated for a year as to whether or not to institute a primitive form of smallpox vaccination called varialization of his revolutionary army, suggesting a familiarity with what the disease could do to his ranks. Historians also note how haggard Abraham Lincoln appeared during the delivery of the historic Gettysburg Address, and this may have been attributable to the fact that he developed smallpox in the days shortly thereafter. It's hard to imagine what the implications of Lincoln not giving this famed address at this moment in time would have been, but this was nearly the case. For this and other fascinating instances of when the disease of smallpox intersects with our history, consider reading William Fagy's House on Fire. During the 20th century, smallpox was responsible for between 300 and 500 million deaths. Mortality aside, it also made for a miserable experience. The initial stages of the disease would feel like a very bad bout of influenza, followed by the development of a rash that initially affected the mouth and mucous membranes, but then spread to the skin, literally pockmarking the skin with hundreds of fine and at times bleeding pustules. The mortality rate for smallpox infection was around 30%, and should one survive, it would often be scarred by erupted lesions, and in many cases blinded should these lesions affect the eyes. Multiply this by the estimated 50 million people contracting the virus each year, as was the case in the 1950s, and you have a true blight on humanity. So I mentioned two things which I believe helped D.A. Henderson and the WHO conquer smallpox. The first was an innovation in technology, and that technology was the bifurcated needle. When undertaking a mass inoculation campaign, speed is everything. Thanks to the work of Edward Jenner, we had a perfectly good vaccine that if administered quickly enough, could actually limit the severity of the disease in addition to preventing one from contracting it. Still, the speed at which the virus can be transmitted by airborne droplets can be astonishing, with every sneeze being a detonation of infectious mist. Drawing up the vaccine from a vial, prepping the skin to be vaccinated, and then administering the vaccine can take up to six minutes 
when you have an entire town of a thousand to 10,000 that needs to be vaccinated, this can quickly lead to days of work. Furthermore, when the particles of a sneeze can travel between 80 and 160 kilometers per hour, between 50 and 100 miles per hour roughly, it becomes literally difficult to keep up with the disease. The bifurcated needle helped to address this issue of needing a more rapid inoculation process. In 1965, Benjamin Rubin, a microbiologist working with Wyeth Labs, was experimenting with needle design for the delivery of vaccines. One of the designs involved grinding down one end of a sewing machine eyelet needle. The resulting fork-like pattern did something very interesting. It could hold a single drop of vaccine between its two prongs, or tines. The administration of the vaccine involved 15 quick superficial punctures to the skin and could be done in the space of 10 seconds. Coupled with the reduction of the amount of vaccine needed, this was truly a breakthrough in the efficiency of vaccine delivery as a small team of vaccinators could then inoculate a line of people extremely quickly. Now, large groups of individuals, in fact entire townships, could be vaccinated within a day. In fact, so impressive was this new technique that Henderson himself was once noted to have said, if there was an invention which could be said to have truly benefited mankind, it was Ben Rubin's eloquently simple bifurcated needle. The tragedy here? It still wasn't fast enough to contain the disease. This is evidenced by the failure of early efforts of the WHO to eradicate smallpox prior to the time frame that D.A. Henderson took the reins of the WHO Global Smallpox Eradication Program. This leads us to the second innovation which ultimately led to victory over the dread disease smallpox that we will cover in our next essay. Check back to see how this innovation proved one of the deciding factors when so many other well-funded global initiatives had failed in the years previous to this. Thanks for listening to Curative Design. I'm Arun Matthews.